it becomes increasingly an issue for some Christian groups within the country, and especially those that are most politically active in the Republican Party. So you have them beginning to say, wait a second, you know, if you're a good Christian, you've got to support a Jewish state in Palestine. That really means supporting the state of Israel. And of course, there are plenty of Christians who have all kinds of different opinions about this. But if you look at how it is that those Christian leaders associated, especially with the Republican Party, and especially with the right wing of the Republican Party, talk, Israel and pro-Israel sentiment become larger and larger and larger. And it's not just pro-Israel sentiment, but it's actually sentiments that are very sympathetic to the arguments of the Israeli right that say, not only should Israel exist, but Israel should have complete control of biblical territory of Israel. So, so there's no room for a Palestinian state dominance. Gaza is a narrow coastal territory of about 2 million people, overwhelmingly Palestinians, sandwiched between Israel and Egypt. It's governed in limited fashion by Hamas, an anti-Israeli Islamist group. On October 7th of 2023, Hamas launched a devastating attack from Gaza on Israel. On that day alone, over 1,200 lives were lost, and more than 240 hostages were taken. Israel responded with military force, plunging the region into chaos. Since October 7th, it's estimated that over 11,000 Palestinians have been killed, and of those, about 4,600 have been children. I grew up with the Middle East being at the forefront of American foreign policy across numerous presidencies, all working towards some lasting peace in the region, and especially between Israelis and Palestinians. But in all honesty, I'm not really familiar with the root of the conflict and how it's evolved, and as a result, how to place the events of October 7th into some context that helps me understand how critical the situation may continue to be and if peace is ever a viable solution in the region. And judging from how I hear most other people talk about the conflict, they don't really know either. But they all seem to have an opinion. So today I'm talking to Dr. Nathan Brown, professor at George Washington University and leading scholar on the Middle East. Dr. Brown is a former Guggenheim Fellow and Carnegie Scholar who has served as an advisor to the committee drafting the Palestinian Constitution and currently serves on the Board of Trustees at the American University in Cairo. We talk about the history of conflict in the Middle East region, particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, how it's evolved, what happened on October 7th, what it means for the possibility of any lasting peace in the region, and how the American response is so critical to how this all plays out. If you like this episode or any episode, please give it a like on your favorite podcast platform and or subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. And as always, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, please feel free to email me at deepdivewithshawn at gmail.com. Let's do a deep dive. Dr. Brown, thanks for being here. How are you? Uh, Good. Thanks for having me. Let's start here, which I think is maybe going back in time a bit, because October 7th, the events of October 7th didn't happen in some kind of a vacuum. There's, There's some history to it. And I think to most people, and that, and I include myself as one of them, average news consumers, or maybe people that are kind of ancillarily interested in historical events, the Arab-Israeli conflict begins post World War One, and that would be with like the Declaration of Israel as a state in 1948. But to my limited understanding, the history is really much more complex and has roots much further back in time. And so I guess I'm wondering if it's possible for you to give an overview of this conflict that does maybe a bit more justice to the actual history than just Israel was created and the Arab world is perhaps angry about it. I actually think that uh, sort of standard story is not necessarily a bad place to start. It's not because there was no history prior to the 20th century, but because that's really when we get the conflict in its current form, which is a conflict between sort of two national communities. So Jews were certainly in the world before 1948. Palestinians and Arabs uh, certainly have historical roots going going back pretty far. But in essence, what I would say is this is not a post-World War II conflict. It was born in the period really after the First World War, when you have a Jewish national movement arise, and there are people in the territory 
known as Palestine, who are increasingly uncomfortable with that. And uncomfortable becomes a mild understatement uh, understatement over time. So the Jewish national movement, Zionism, was really about saying Jews are a people, Judaism is a religion, Jews are all over the world, but fundamentally Jews are a national community. And their national community, I mean, this is, you know, the period of nationalism, national communities need to have their own state. They need to be able to build up not just religious institutions, not just have kind of cultural production. They really need some some core territory to be able to express themselves. And of course, this was at a time when Jews are increasingly feeling unwelcome in Europe. Most Jews in Europe stay or they go to North America, they go to other places. But the Zionist movement says we've got to go and recreate the Jewish national home in Palestine. And there is a community there of people that we call Palestinian now. The term Palestinian certainly would have been known then, but that were Arab, Arabic speaking, predominantly Muslim with a large Christian minority. There were actually Jews who were resident in Palestine who would have had Arabic as a first language. But the British get control of this territory after World War One. It had been part of the Ottoman Empire before that. The British get control of the territory with a mandate from the League of Nations. And the mandate from the League of Nations basically said two things. Number one, you, Great Britain, are responsible for this territory, but you're responsible in getting it ready for independence. And the second thing that the League of Nations mandates that is that you are required to facilitate the construction of a Jewish national home in Palestine. That's about four declarations. Declaration of British policy during World War I, and then it gets written into the League of Nations mandate. So they're supposed to do two things at once. facilitate. Palestinian independence and facilitate the construction of a Jewish national home, whatever that meant. And nobody was quite clear what it meant to do both those things at the same time. Mm. That ultimately becomes impossible because with increasing Jewish immigration to Palestine, the non-Jews in Palestine coalesce against the idea of creation of a Jewish national home. And you finally have the British mandate collapse in the post-World War II period, as you say, The state of Israel is declared on about two-thirds of that territory, and the other third is uh, controlled by surrounding Arab states, Jordan and Egypt. The core of the conflict, as we see it right now, a a, a dispute over territory, this this territory, dispute between two national movements, a Palestinian national movement and 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 a Zionist, a Jewish national movement, that really is something that's born in the 20th century. Is it too reductive to say that, or to characterize this as being primarily a territorial issue or a geographic issue? And the reason I ask is, I guess I wonder in another world where there was some piece of undeclared, uninhabited land that was amenable to Jews, and that was, Israel was built out of that cloth, and it didn't intersect in any way with any other type of national community, would we have the same issue? If it was uninhabited, no, um, I don't think I don't think you would have. But it was inhabited, right? And so, yeah, that that's really what it is. It becomes a territorial conflict when people begin to think about, okay, how are we going to square this circle? How are we going to treat both of these peoples? And they're increasingly seeing themselves as peoples fairly. And so, the idea of partition comes up. It comes up as early as the 1930s. Like, let's just divide this territory. Let's make it a territorial conflict. That's the sort of thing where you can sit down and negotiate borders and so on. And and it's a controversial idea. It's not accepted by large portions of either side. But that's when it becomes seen at least partly as a territorial conflict. So you mentioned uh, negotiating borders. And I guess that brings me to my next question, which is, since essentially it's creation, history in this area is riddled with some type of negotiated peace in the Middle East. But If we take this in the context, as you've just explained it, and then we consider the events of October 7th, which I want to talk about in a minute, generally in hindsight, it does appear as if these uh, negotiations have all been failures. They haven't amounted to any type of longstanding or enduring peace. So is it fair to characterize the situation this way? Or is there maybe some more nuance that, you know, isn't entirely obvious to me or that I'm not capturing? There's a little bit more nuance, but I think a failure 
is uh, definitely an appropriate term to use if what you mean by success is some kind of negotiated peaceful settlement that is acceptable to all parties. That just hasn't happened. There have been some long-term arrangements that have been negotiated. So State of Israel was declared in 1948. There is, at that point, a series of armistice agreements negotiated between the new State of Israel and the surrounding Arab states. So this is not just a ceasefire, it's an armistice, there are lines drawn up, there's uh, some kind of idea of starting some kind of process for negotiating some kind of more, something more permanent even than than, than an armistice. Those go nowhere, and it kind of sits there for about 20 years or so. That is to say, this was a situation that didn't kind of press itself as critical or urgent. Um, You know, there would be flare-ups, and sometimes, you know, in 1956, there was an actual war. But those periods aside, the armistice basically seemed to hold, and there wasn't a lot of pressing diplomatic attention to resolving it. If what Again, if what we mean by resolution is some kind of permanent settlement acceptable to all parties. That's really it only happens in 1967 when there's an Israeli... Arab War, which winds up with Israel in control of the entire territory of Palestine, the West Bank and Gaza, which would be which were those parts of, the, of Palestine that they hadn't controlled at the end of the 1948 war. They're suddenly in control of all of this. This is when you begin to get the UN Security Council resolutions on the subject, when you begin to get periodic high-level diplomacy, and the United States intermittently gets involved in trying to find some kind of negotiated settlement first between Israel and the surrounding Arab states, and then later on between Israel and Palestinians. And so then October 7th, last year, so to someone like me, this seems to have come out of nowhere. But I wonder if perhaps this was inevitable, and maybe maybe the timing wasn't as predictable. But to folks like maybe yourself, that this was inevitable, maybe on the margins, the scale was a bit of a surprise. To that end, can you help explain maybe what happened on October 7th of last year and kind of the subsequent events since, but in doing so, the why of it and 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 how we can understand these events in the context of the history that you've just explained to us? Um, sure. It has a very complex background. It was deeply shocking, and it is, I think, an important transition point, but it doesn't come out of nowhere, as you suggest. So in the mid-1990s, the Israeli and Palestinian leaderships finally begin to try to come to terms with each other as national communities. So the Israeli leadership under uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was then prime minister, Palestinian leadership, head of the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, essentially say, we're going to recognize each other as legitimate, and we will sit down and negotiate some kind of final agreement between the two of us. While we are doing that, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza will be allowed some measure of autonomy and be allowed to manage their own affairs. And the problem was that the first part of that uh, was just got nowhere. Any kind of Israeli-Palestinian agreement, peace settlement, just didn't happen. The negotiations were basically stillborn. The second part of that, Palestinian autonomy in the meantime, was imperfectly implemented. But you do have this creation called the Palestinian Authority that is supposed to be governing Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. When the first part of that process, the peace process between Israel and Palestinians, collapse in, and there's violence, what was referred to as the Palestinian uprising of, of, of 2000 subsequent years, happens, the conflict enters a new phase. In, in the, uh, 2006, you have an attempt to sort of reconfigure things on the Palestinian side with new Palestinian elections, which the Americans, the international community are very supportive of saying, look, if we can get a strong Palestinian leadership out of this, then we will be able to kind of resume negotiations with Israel. And those elections, for a variety of reasons, produce a majority in Palestinian parliament run by Hamas, uh, this Islamic movement which says we reject this entire negotiation process. And that was a problem. The Israelis reacted and the Americans reacted saying essentially, this is unacceptable. And there was an attempt essentially to bring pressure on the Palestinian political system to get rid of Hamas. And it wound up not with getting rid of Hamas, but with essentially an intra-Palestinian civil war. 
with one half of it having control of the West Bank that's run by Fatah, one Palestinian political faction. It's head by Mahmoud Abbas, and Hamas is in control of Gaza. So that's a situation that exists from 2007 forward. Hamas has always said, we're not about running Gaza. We didn't start you know, the Islamic resistance movement, which is the full name of Hamas in Arabic, the Islamic resistance movement. We didn't start Hamas in order to become municipal administrators in the Gaza Strip. And so they were always looking for some way to break out of this, to maintain their hold in Gaza, not be thrown out of Gaza. That's kind of their toehold in Palestinian politics. But somehow move things forward. There are periodic outbursts of rocket fire from Gaza, Israel. Israel responds extremely harshly. Periodic rounds of fighting. When I first heard the news on October 6th, what I, I, what I, what I thought was, well, this is a replay of that. This is another attempt by Hamas, essentially, to let people know we're still here. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, Hamas chose a much more ambitious set of attacks one that resulted in 1,200 Israeli casualties along the uh, the border of Gaza. And so the idea that Hamas was trying to break out of this, that Hamas was saying the status quo is unacceptable, the fact that Hamas was trying to sort of upset the apple cart, none of that was news. The extent of success that they had and the number of casualties was deeply shocking. I think it was probably a surprise to the Hamas leadership itself. But it was also one that generated an extremely strong reaction in Israeli society, an interpretation that said basically, okay, we thought we had some kind of modus vivendi. Now we discover that really a lot of Israelis reacted this way. Hamas wants us dead. That's their agenda. There's no compromise. There's no living with this group. We have to destroy it. And so that's how this these October attacks really became a sea change, a, a conflict that had been bitter and violent, but sort of carried out within some kind of constraints, suddenly all constraints were off. You've touched on this, I think, inherent in in your response, but we hear often about a two-state solution. What I know is that it's not a viable solution for Israelis or for Israel, and it's something that Palestinians desperately want. And primarily, I I don't know if this is the reason Gaza is often referred to as like an open air prison. And as you kind of mentioned, you know, it's more of like a municipal administration than it is any type of autonomous governing situation. I would assume that a two state solution would solve that problem. Can you help me understand why it's not a viable option for Israel? Well, it's, yeah, I would say it's a bit more complicated than that. So the idea of territorial partition Essentially, you have a, a Jewish entity, national entity, and a Palestinian national entity. That goes back to the 1930s when the idea is first proposed. And, um, you know, the, there are all kinds of questions. Okay, where are you going to draw the line? And what happens with Palestinians who live within the Jewish national entity? And this sort of thing. And it's unpopular at first from a Palestinian point of view. They're saying, wait a second, we're at, at the time in the 30s, we're the vast majority in this country. By all means, you know, Jews are welcome to stay here, but uh, those who are already here, but but we can't be, be dividing this place in half. We're at this point, you know, 80, 90 percent of the population. And so it was rejected on that side. In 1948, essentially when the British mandate ended, the British said, we can't handle the situation anymore. We're pulling out. And the United Nations set up a special committee on Palestine, which recommended partition. And once again, the Palestinian leadership said, Hold on a second. This isn't fair. This isn't the way to do it. We can have a single state that is home for everybody. The partition plan divides us incredibly unfairly. We reject the plan. And and so up until really the 1970s, the bulk of the Palestinian national movement said, forget about partition. We need a we need a Palestinian state, which which includes Christians, Jews, Muslims, you know, Palestinians, Israelis, everybody. In the 1970s, Palestinian national leadership began to think, well, maybe the best we can get is partition. And not until 1988 do they formally declare what they call the issue of Palestinian Declaration of Independence, which recognizes the United Nations partition plan from uh, 1948. They say this was unfair, but look, we'll accept it. 
And then it becomes kind of a question from the Palestinian point of view of negotiating a two-state outcome with Israel. Where are you going to draw the lines? Who's going to have which kinds of rights? What about Palestinians who've been forced out of this territory, refugees in Lebanon, surrounding countries? Do they get to come back? Those are the sorts of things we'll have to negotiate. But fundamentally, we accept a two-state solution. Israeli leadership didn't sign on at that point. They said, beginning in the 1990s, okay, we'll recognize Palestinians as a national community, right? You have the Oslo Accord, and this agreement between Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat that says, we'll recognize you as a national community, we'll recognize each other. But the Israelis held out. They said, we're not agreeing to a Palestinian state. Maybe, as part of negotiation, we'll agree to that. And so you have the Palestinians at this point pressing much stronger for a Palestinian state and pressing for a two-state solution. And the Israelis won't endorse it. The Americans won't endorse it. My favorite example here is in 1998, Hillary Clinton, when she was first lady, said in a public address, made some reference to a Palestinian state being an outcome of the negotiation process. The White House spokesman says the next day, she doesn't speak for the White House. I mean, she was living in the White House, but she didn't speak for it. And so the idea of a Palestinian state and two-state solution was unspeakable from the Israeli and the American side. Then people thought that it might be an impossible outcome, but they said essentially that's a reward to hold out for the Palestinians. It's something that will come only if they give concession, all kinds of concessions. So not until the 2000s does there become a much stronger international consensus for Palestinian state. Bill Clinton mentions the idea at the very, you know, very final days of this presidency. George Bush picks it up. And, and that's when you have the phrase two-state solution enter the international lexicon. Is, well, of course, everybody knows what the solution is. There needs to be a two-state solution. And now let's negotiate the details. That's really only that that kind of thinking is really only about two decades old, a little bit more than two decades old. And the problem was that although the idea then gets accepted diplomatically internationally, you've got problems on both sides, Israeli and Palestinian side, where people are turning away from it. On the Israeli side, they said, wait a second, you know, we agreed to the construction of Palestinian authority, and that's not even a state, and look how many how much problems are causing us with the Intifada and the election of Hamas. Forget this. We're not we're not so sold on the idea of a of, of a of a two state solution. So you have Israelis turning their backs on it, and you have an Israeli right wing that's growing more p- powerful, saying, "Hold on a second, that territory that's allocated for a Palestinian state that's part of our historic homeland as Jews. We can't give that up." So the, you have you have the Israeli uh, population sort of slowly swinging against it. But on the Palestinian side. They're saying, hey, we agreed to this peace process, we agreed to go along, and it's not delivering a Palestinian state. It's not that we're against a two-state solution, but we've got to wake up and smell the coffee. It's not happening. And talk about a two-state solution, and this international, all these international conferences, is just a way to mask the reality on the ground, which is taking us step by step every single day in the wrong direction for us. And then, of course, with the uh, split between the West Bank and Gaza, between Fatah and Hamas in 2007, you even have a split uh, national leadership on the Palestinian side. So the two-state solution, which is, as I say, something that becomes almost every single international diplomat begins to endorse it about 20 years ago, it begins to increasingly seem like for people on the ground, like, this isn't happening. This isn't happening anytime soon. It may never be happening. All the trends are pointing in a different direction. So international diplomacy was talking one way while facts on the ground were moving the other direction. So we're recording this on February 13th, and overnight, the U.S. Senate approved an aid package for both Israel and Ukraine. But I don't know if you've been following this. The leadership in the House, which is Republican leadership, has essentially said uh, that it's pretty much dead on arrival. And I think that's primarily because of the Ukraine aid that's attached to it. This is maybe a rough characterization, but I am interested in how this issue or this situation between Israel and Palestine specifically has evolved into a left-right issue with the right being more aligned with Israel and the left being more aligned with Palestine. This is something that's fairly new. It's been growing for a, a few years, I would say. But historically, it hasn't been a partisan issue, or at least not in a sharp sense. 
there have been times when Republicans have been seen as more pro-Arab or at least less sympathetic to Israel. There have been times that Democrats have been seen that way. But essentially, there's a lot of continuity in policy uh, between Democratic and Republican administrations. And certainly when there was a viable peace process, which I would say it was during the Bush and uh, the first Bush and the Clinton administrations, arguing that the second Bush administrations, you even have continuity of people. Some of the same people are involved in this. But I think things are happening in the United States that are pushing in a different direction in both the Republican and Democratic parties. In the Republican Party, there's an increasing sense uh, that this is not just an issue for Jewish Americans about Jewish national rights, but it becomes increasingly an issue for some Christian groups within the country, and especially those that are most politically active in the Republican Party. So you have them beginning to say, wait a second, you know, if you're a good Christian, you've got to support a Jewish state in Palestine. That really means supporting the state of Israel. And of course, there are plenty of Christians who have all kinds of different opinions about this. But if you look at how it is that those Christian leaders associated, especially with the Republican Party, and especially with the right wing of the Republican Party, talk, Israel and pro-Israel sentiments become larger and larger and larger. And it's not just pro-Israel sentiment, but it's actually sentiments that are very sympathetic to the arguments of the Israeli right that say, not only should Israel exist, but Israel should have complete control of biblical territory of Israel. So, so there's no room for a Palestinian state in all this. So that's happening in the Republican side. In the Democratic side, I see there as being a real generational shift. I mean, I sense this when I teach, when I talk to people of various generations, that younger people on the left will tend to see this much more as sort of an issue of equity, of social justice, and so on. So there's kind of a natural tendency to say, okay, who's the oppressed and who's the oppressor? We've got Palestinians who are being denied national rights, being denied human rights, and we have an Israeli state that is violating their human rights, colonizing, seizing their land, and so forth and so on. And these are arguments that resonate, in, especially in younger progressive circles. And it's a problem, I think, for the Democratic Party because they've got essentially a split base, an older generation that looked at Israel one way as being sort of an American ally, as being a hero, sort of small country that um, managed to defend itself, created out of the ashes of the Holocaust and so on. That resonates with an older generation of people on the left and a younger generation that says, hold on a second, you know, you're going to tell us that black lives matter, but Palestinian lives don't? This, we, we see some continuity here. Mm -hmm. And that's something that becomes, I think, more pronounced really even just within the last four or five years or so. So I want to dig into a couple of things that you talked about. And I don't quite know how to separate out political ideology in this. And maybe maybe that's the point. But there are three areas of interest that are at play in the region. There's obviously more, but there are three that I want to talk about. And one is the Israeli government. Another is American involvement. And then the third is Arab world interests in the region and how these interplay and exacerbate or maybe temper the situation in the region. So let's start with Israel, though. So Netanyahu's government, his current government, is characterized as being the most conservative, the most far-right government in Israel's history. And, you know, he's rightly or wrongly taking a lot of heat for the events of October 7th, both the events of that day and Israel's response to it. Public opinion generally seems to be shifting against him, not just in Israel, but globally. And again, fairly or unfairly, I'm not taking a side here, but I do wonder how Netanyahu's government has influenced the situation for the good or the bad. Well, yeah, this is a, a government that is a coalition, and it's a coalition, I would say, between sort of the traditional Israeli right, which is nationalistic, it is hostile to the idea of territorial compromise with the Palestinians, but willing to countenance some variation of it. And then what might be considered the far right, but which what I would call sort of the nationalist religious camp. And this is a, a, a group, there's a couple political parties in it who tend to be drawn much more from Orthodox Jews 
who see this not just as a national conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, but really focus on Zionism's religious nature and say, essentially, this is the territory that was promised to us in the Bible. This is Jewish land, and non-Jews are here, but they're not they're not going to be full citizens. This is fundamentally a Jewish a, a Jewish country, and has to remain so. And any sort of territorial compromise is is, is unacceptable. And that's been always there on the far right of the Israeli political spectrum, but they're now essential members of this current ruling coalition, and they certainly affect policy. When the October crisis happened, Netanyahu was able to widen his cabinet slightly and bring in some people a little bit more from the center. But that far right, that national religious camp is still very much in there. They've got key ministries like finance. They've got internal security ministry. And so they're certainly able to affect policy, to block revenue transfers, to give essentially some cover to Jews in the West Bank who attack Palestinians. And, and this area. they're definitely affecting policy. They make it very difficult when it comes to any kind of pressure to limit the scale of the fighting in Gaza, uh, to protect civilians, or, or that sort of thing, this group can really try to throw a monkey wrench in any sort of, of, of diplomatic efforts. This is maybe rank speculation, but does this current conflict doom Netanyahu's leadership? People have said that. And I think ultimately it probably will, but it's not clear. So in Israeli political terms, there are people who could never stand with Netanyahu. And, you know, the country might be divided 50-50 prior to uh, the, the recent outbreak about, and we're pretty much down the middle on pro versus anti-Netanyahu. His personality was really almost the center of Israeli politics. What happened in Tobias, what it did was convince even some Israelis who were kind of in, in the pro-Netanyahu camp, hold on a second, this was an enormous disaster. He's got to take responsibility. And that's never been Netanyahu's strong suit. So the idea that his political career would be over as soon as the Israeli response was deciding you don't throw somebody over in the middle of warfare, but as soon as this is over, Netanyahu's got to go, that began to spread and be accepted pretty widely. And certainly his standing in public opinion polls has absolutely plummeted. And if there were to be an election today, his party would lose you know, conceivably half of its, its seats. He, he couldn't put together a, a, a coalition today. But the war keeps going. And there is now a slightly broader coalition that's keeping him as prime minister. So it's not clear that there's going to be any end to the war anytime soon. If you ask me, is Netanyahu going to be prime minister two years from now? I would say probably not. But it's no longer looking as certain as it did immediately after the October attacks. We talked a little bit about the political situation related to Israel in the United States and the partisan, the evolving partisan divide. But I am interested in the not only American involvement, but the position that America or the United States may end up taking as it relates to not just aid for Israel, but support generally for Israel. And it does seem like both parties right now are, I, I almost feel like the best way to characterize it is, is chaos. I mean, the Republican Party is divided. There are hardline Republican supporters of Israel, and there are hardline nationalists on the right that would rather be more conservative with at least the financing side of it. And then, you know, as we discussed related to the generational divide on the Democratic side and support for Israel v. Palestine. And then you have President Biden, who seems to be struggling with landing on a position, or at least that position is evolving from what we understand. You know, he has a very public support for Israel, but it seems as if privately he's evolving a bit and frustrated with Netanyahu. And he's definitely alluding to more sympathetic position as it relates to Palestinians. And I guess I'm wondering how much this chaos in the United States could have a tangible impact on the tension in the region and where you, given, I suppose, the history and the current situation in the United States, see this going. 
I think it has had a real effect. I mean, the uh, the Biden administration began with essentially an unlimited and unqualified public support for Israel. And that was remarkable. It caused discontent among some younger members of the Democratic Party and, and others. But it was absolutely remarkable. You know, uh, by personally visiting Israel, you have the United States publicly opposing and continuing to publicly oppose calls for a ceasefire. Uh, you have uh, the Americans saying things like, you know, this can't end with uh, Hamas still in power and essentially endorsing some of its real war aims. I think there was a little bit more nuance in private, and that may have grown a little bit. There was an attempt, I think, by the United States to persuade Israel not to widen the conflict to Iran and Lebanon and so on, and that was successful. And there was an attempt to sort of gently pressure Israel, saying, okay, if you win this war, then what are you going to do? What's good, what are you going to do on the day after? But that was pretty gentle, and it was probably a lot more in private than in public. As the war has grown, gone, gone on, as the extent that destruction of lives and property in Gaza has mounted, and you know, have created a situation in which something like 80% of the population of Gaza has been driven from their homes, they've leveled schools and universities, and so on. They, they, this, this amount of destruction. And as it goes on and on, and as it's clear that the Israelis will not articulate any kind of vision for any sort of post-war situation that would be at all viable for Palestinians, there is evidence of discomfort. But we're also getting closer and closer to the November election. And so I think what the Biden administration has done is essentially begin to signal discontent a little bit in public, but also through leaking of comments. And you'll see this sometimes, you know, Biden is frustrated. He's used a few obscenities to refer to Netanyahu, and this gets leaked to the Israeli press and, and, and so on. But I think the real attempt is, is by a presidential re-election campaign that is trying to square this circle of taking a, essentially a pro-Israeli policy and trying to sort of give a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to opponents of within the Democratic base saying, don't worry, we're really pressuring Israel behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to overlook, the players here are not the United States, Palestine, and Israel. It's it, This is much more of a global issue, but particularly for Arab neighbors in the region. And I don't want to overlook you know, the impact that this conflict has on them and also their role in uh, the region. So I don't want to paint all Arab countries with a broad brush, but I do wonder if we can talk a little bit about some of the bigger players in the region and how they've been contributing to the present conflict or not, and the role that they're playing now. Sure. So there are some key actors within the region, but you almost have to distinguish between the policies of states and their leaders and sort of general opinion within the region. General opinion within the region, outside of Israel, within the Arab world, sees this as, I mean, the terms used are extremely strong. This is, we might refer to the United States very often, you know, a war in Gaza. This is a war on Gaza. This is genocidal. This is Israel's attack, Israel's attempt to eliminate the Palestinian people. And so on. So extremely strong uh, language being used, and the United States is being seen as essentially aiding and abetting and even arming and supplying an Israeli attack on an entire people. That's how it's how it's generally seen within uh, the region. There's not a lot of dissent from that. At the same time, you have states involved that who basically reoriented themselves over the last generation or so to say, essentially, look, we're states we have interests. Yeah, we've got sympathy for the Palestinians, but we're not going to make that the centerpiece of all of our policy within the region. Israel's a strong state. It's not going away. Let's just work out some kind of modus vivendi. That might be something quiet, or it might be actually formal diplomatic relation. It's difficult for those states to move forward with anything formal and public while this war is going on. And so they have kind of found a position where they say, we're not going to break ties with Israel over this. 
but we're not going to move forward at all, or states like Saudi Arabia that have not established ties with Israel won't take the step of doing so unless they get specific things in return. And what they need to hear from Israel is we're actually going to sign on to a process that leads to a two-state solution. And especially for Saudi Arabia, this isn't just about Israel. It's also about the United States. They're saying to the United States, you want us to accept Israel within the region. Not only do you have to deliver something from Israel, but you have to deliver something to us. You have to give us a security guarantee. And then we'll sign on to this American view of the region. You know, in a lot of ways for all of the intervention in a conflict, and here I'm talking across you know many countries, across many decades, it feels as if we seem to consistently be kind of just in the same place, or or maybe worse if we take into consideration October 7th. And I guess it's really difficult not to see this as an unsolvable issue. And by that, I'm talking about to some type of an end that's agreeable, maybe if not endorsable, to all of the parties involved. When you think about this, do you see this as something that has a solution? It has a solution that you know way to get there. And there are all kinds of solutions. And I think a lot of the problem, policy thinking, is that there's been a lot of focus on the solution and a lot of wishful thinking about how to get there. So a two-state solution. Hmm. Israel and Palestine living peacefully side by side. Great. How do you get there? We're actually moving farther apart from that. So you throw up your hand and say, okay, you're not going to have a two-state solution. Let's have one state with equal rights for everybody. Well, Israelis will say, especially Israeli Jews will say, wait a second, we've got our own state right now. You want us to dissolve in a state where we still become the minority? No thanks. How do you get there? So I think in terms of the, it being insoluble in theory, no. But insoluble in practice, I think it is, at least for the next, for I would say the short to medium term. A generation later, things will look different. I mean, all sorts of things look different. Germany and France fought three wars in several decades, in, 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 in 70 years, then became allies. Something different is possible. I didn't think, if you'd asked me in the 1970s when I was a kid, when will apartheid end in South Africa? And I'd say half a century from now, at minimum, it ended. So there are ways this might be different, but in terms of it becoming different anytime soon, or there being any viable process that can lead to a some kind of peaceful outcome, I don't see that as likely. Honestly, I don't think see it as likely in my lifetime. If we talk about just the present conflict, have you given any thought to how you think this might end? Yes. Um, and uh, my short answer is that I'm not sure that it will. Mm. It will not end with a bang, but with a lot of whimpering. So, so when people talked immediately after the beginning of the Israeli military campaign, they began to say, what would happen the day after the conflict? And I remember thinking at the time, I'm not sure there will be a clear day after. There's an Israeli military campaign with a set of articulated goals about eliminating Hamas military capability and eliminating it from government that are kind of open-ended. Also, the kinds of security measures that Israel has been openly talking about are ones that really need a permanent presence in Gaza in some way, shape, or form. They've been creating buffer zones, they've been destroying neighborhoods and towns and villages, and they've been talking about saying things like Israel is only Israel can be responsible for its own security in Gaza, which implies some continual level of military operations and so on. So I think that what we're looking at is a situation in which in the absence of some kind of grand political settlement or grand diplomatic outcome in the kinds that the United States is pursuing, what you'll see instead is a situation in which you have lower level conflict, continued Israeli sort of occupation of less inhabited areas in, in Gaza, a rearrangement of Gaza's population, a prohibition on Gaza's doing much in terms of, of, of rebuilding and a way in which humanitarian aid is channeled in through agencies that the Israelis find acceptable, and this being essentially the indefinite future. Um, that's what I think is the situation that we're, that we're moving towards, that we're already in a sense halfway towards. All right, final question. You ready for it? Sure. What's something interesting you've been reading, watching, listening to, or doing lately? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, 
this is honestly the most depressing time to follow this in my professional career. So some of some of the things I've been doing and uh, reading have been trying to distract myself from it. But I think for those people who are interested in following this, I think there's you know th- these are lively societies. It's, it's, it's just an awful time. Israeli press is very accessible in English. I mean, there's the Haaretz, there's Jerusalem Post, there's Times of Israel. There's ways to follow kind of the Israeli debates on this that are kind of a little bit like drinking from a fire hose sometimes. On the Palestinian side, there's an awful lot less that's accessible in, in English. That's actually part of the Palestinian problem is that they have trouble articulating themselves their positions in ways that the international community can understand. There's actually even an outfit in Beirut, however, called the uh, Zaytuna Center, Z-E-I-T-O-N-T-O-U-N-E-H, Zaytuna Center, which is, they're actually a pro-Hamas think tank. So you want to find out just what this conflict looks like from a completely different point of view. Hmm. That's something that's, that's real interesting to watch as well. International crisis groups give some 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 great sort of overall analytical reports for those people who've got time and uh, don't mind forty page documents with lots of footnotes. There's international crisis group. Finally, I would say if it it doesn't sound too egotistical, there's a co- collection that uh, a colleague of mine with the Carnegie Endowment and I have been sort of trying to put out. Where we we're, what we're trying to do is c- communicate from various points of view. Just what are the relevant debates? How do people see this conflict? We first had a group of Israelis write in and say, here's the debates that are going on in Israel. And a group of Palestinians say, here's a group, here's the debates that are going on. We're going to have a couple more installments on that, international, regional actors, and so on. So that's at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, www.ceip.org. Um, you can see that uh, uh, governs in Gaza collection. So those would be some things to read. But I'd also say that anybody who is interested in following this, uh, you'll probably wind up being a little bit discouraged and dismayed. So have some a good distracting novel to turn to when the realities get a little bit too much. Dr. Brown, thanks for taking the time. I've I've uh, I've really appreciated the conversation. Thank you. I want to close this episode with a plea to our better angels. In the contemporary world where conflicts such as the one in Gaza continue to arise, the imperative of compassion for all individuals, especially civilians caught in conflict zones, cannot be overstated. The essence of compassion lies in the recognition of a shared humanity, an acknowledgement that regardless of one's nationality or religion or political beliefs, every person deserves to live in safety, peace, and dignity. The conflict in Gaza, a symbol of long-standing disputes and hostilities, underscores the dire consequences that ensue when compassion is overshadowed by animosity and aggression. Civilians in these conflict zones often bear the brunt of the suffering. They are subjected to the horrors of violence, displacement, loss of loved ones, and the destruction of their homes and communities. And the psychological and physical scars inflicted upon these individuals can span generations, perpetuating cycles of grief and hostility, and suffering. Embracing compassion means advocating for and implementing policies that first protect civilians, ensuring that they have access to humanitarian aid and supporting efforts to rebuild what has been lost. It involves listening to the stories of all of those who have suffered, acknowledging their pain, and taking concrete steps to alleviate their suffering. Compassion should prompt international actors and conflicting parties to prioritize diplomatic solutions and peace-building measures over military interventions, recognizing that true security and stability are achieved not through dominance, but through justice and mutual understanding. The conflict in Gaza is a poignant reminder of the devastation that arises from a lack of compassion. It calls upon humanity to look beyond divisions, beyond partisanship, which is reductive and harmful, to see the suffering of civilians in conflict zones, and to act with empathy and resolve. In fostering compassion for all people, we pave the way toward a more peaceful, just, and interconnected world. With that, I'm going to urge us all to consider the devastation and the pain and the horror and the hopelessness that innocents in Israel and Palestine are enduring right now, and to avoid painting with a broad brush that vilifies entire groups. And to the innocent souls that have lost their lives, Godspeed. All right, check back soon for another episode of Deep Dive. Chat soon, folks.